We'll start at the beginning as a teenager. Yes. It happens to be that some things happen with great timing, and this man happened to have the timing of getting a job two days before something extraordinary happened. So maybe you could just tell us. No, that's right. That. I mean, you know, it, it's, um, it was remarked upon by Howard Massey, who co-wrote the book, you know, that it was serendipity at the time. And, you know, I tried to get into EMI Studios, not just to you know, be involved with recording music. That was my outset. There was nothing to do with technology or anything else. And then, you know, I got my interview eventually um, in, into EMI Studios. And, and um, Howard always said, that was serendipity. You know, you got into the studios, you sort of went on to you know, Norman Smith sessions as, a, as an assistant, and you got on well with George Martin and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, two days later, after I started, the Beatles came in to record me, uh, to record Love Me Do, which was not their, their first choice of a song, of course. It was the um, How Do You Do It, I believe. And when Lennon made the remark about, no, we want to record one of our own songs. And I think we made three passes of that song that, 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 that night. The reason I was there was to, to learn the ropes of the recording sessions, which was to be oper an op a tape operator, to, you know, to learn my, my, my craft. Um, so the, the versions you probably hear of Love Me Do with the um, No Tambourine is the original recording, and the one with the tambourine is the second recording, which was, I think, two weeks later. So anyway, the Beatles started to, to come into the studio two days after I started, so that's, that's 1962. And the, uh, did you get a sense of John and Paul's relationship early on, of how they, I mean, at this point, EMI is run with people in white coats, and it's very proper, and, well, right? um, Well, yeah, I mean, the thing was with John, first of all, it was very sort of, um, the white coats were the maintenance engineers, the brown coats were the guys that moved the, the uh, music screens, and, and the, the, the chairs, and so forth. We had to wear, wear suit and ties. Uh, we had to be respectable because we were also expected to work on classical recordings as well. And, you know, the classical people like Maria Callas used to come in and, you know, we had to be really respectable with our shoes polished and so forth, right? And their ties and shirts and, and suits. So that, that was where that sort of... I know there's a discrepancy here that happens that we used to wear the white coats. We didn't. The maintenance people wore, wore the white coats, you know. So we were in a position, and our job then was not a technical position. It was to actually record, record music. We weren't allowed to move a jack socket from one hole to the next hole. We had to phone someone up to come down to the studio to do that, which got very embarrassing because you have a whole orchestra sitting in the studio, and you want to make one slight adjustment, and you have to wait for, like, I don't know, three minutes, which is very expensive if you've got a big orchestra in the studio. But they have to run down, you could hear them run down the stairs, right? And they come in the door, and, they, and then they just go, chick, chick. and that was, that was the end of the job. But they, you carried on the session. But as I said, it was, you know, time was money. But, you know, as, as you know, the long story on this is we were gradually breaking down barriers and building new frontiers by the way we were trying to not destroy, but move forward. Right. Now, they, when the Beatles came to doing just cover versions, they, when, when the Beatles oh. did cover versions of songs, they had this unique approach to it, and you had an insight to maybe the Motown stuff or something that was going on here that most people over there weren't aware of, but how did that come about? So the, 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 uh, it wasn't the Beatles doing cover versions. The problem was I went up the ladder really fast. Um, I know I became their recording engineer when I was like 19 years old, uh, but um, certain things changed within the organization, and I was a mastering engineer like a year before I went to be their recording engineer. And because we had sort of uh, rules and regulations as, as how we were supposed to record instruments uh, as regards EMI was concerned, um, they wanted different sounds. And I heard American records as I was remastering them for the, um, for the, for the European market, like all the Tamla stuff, anything that went through Capitol Records or EMI, I was remastering it for Europe. And I was aware of new sounds and new feelings in the music and so forth. So I... Obviously, because being such, such a young kid, I guess, when it came to the point of one, wanting to start re as a recording engineer, which I was told when I was going to join EMI Studios, I would like be 30 years old or 40 years old, right? I'm there like, like, I don't know, 19 years old recording Tomorrow Never Knows, right? So they don't want that wishy-washy sound. And luckily, I was familiar with American sounds on records. And I was trying to sort of achieve something with the... Uh, 
well, with the whatever equipment I was given, which was nothing, which meant abusing equipment and, and actually breaking the rules, especially with the bass drum sounds and the drums going through this Fairchild 660, which we weren't supposed to do, you know. So I just had to break the rules to try, because they didn't want this wishy-washy sound anymore. So Tomorrow Never Knows developed out of that. And plus, you know, Paul made all those loops and so forth. And it was the first time on that drum track, because Ringo couldn't hold time for two half minutes. In the, do it, no, do it, no, no, do, do, do it doing that trump, drum pattern. So we got him to do the drum pattern, um, and we picked like the best two bars, I think it was, of, of the consistent timing, and, and snipped it together. So it was the first time we ever used a drum loop. So we, that drum track on Tomorrow Never Knows is only like two bars, but cop copied. Because no, no, no one could hold time like that in those days. No way, especially Ringo, right? <laughs> well, I know he's like one of the best drummers ever. I know I make fun of him sometimes, but no, he was awesome. No, really. Yeah. So anyway, we have, we've got the loops on this track, and as you know, the rest started to become history. I'm breaking down barriers, building new frontiers, breaking the rules, getting into trouble, could got the sack, you know, and so forth. Especially with the bass drum thing, which was just, you know, I had a letter to say, yes, you can record the bass drum like that, but only on Beatles sessions, you know. <laughs> it, but, and of course the older engineers, they were like 35, 40 year, year, year olds. There was one younger engineer, um, but I was, they, they sort of said, well, we've done it this way for 10 years, you know, we just lift up the faders and we just record it, you know. And, I'm, and you want to see what Jeff did last night, you know, Christ, you know. We, we don't want to do that. We just come into the session and go, ch -ch 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 -ch, and that's the session, you know. So I was getting, they didn't like me, obviously, because I'm a kid, you know, so young, and they're so old, well, not old, but they're 30s, 40s year, year olds, you know. And I was, like, destroying their, their very calm life, I guess, you know. So that's sort of the beginning of it, and I had to, I, I wasn't under demand, I was asked by them to, as you probably well know by whatever, you know, if we were going to do a guitar overdub, they, George would say, or oh, whatever, don't make it sound like a guitar. We're going to do a piano. Don't make it sound like a piano. We're going to do this. Don't make it sound like a piano. But I've got nothing. We've got an eight-track input, input mixing console with, like, no selectable equalization on it except treble and bass, two stereo tape machines, and, and an echo chamber. And, uh, and the nearest thing I could get to an effect was tape echo, which was repeating the t -t 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 sound. So all I could do was over override the equipment, and, over and, and that's how some of those sounds were achieved, especially overriding the Fairchild 660 for the drums, experimenting with a, a, a speaker for, for recording the bass instead of a microphone, and gradually sort of building up this process without offending anyone no, so much in, into EMI as, as a management company. So that's how it all sort of st started. I mean, we could sort of talk, talk about this, you know, for hours, you know. So how did you, uh, okay. how did you, <laughs> how did George Martin feel about you being such a rebel with these sounds and doing these things? He seemed pretty straight-laced. I don't know if, how his sense of humor was underneath and how adventurous he was, but well, at the beginning he played it straight. Well, yeah, no, I know he did. I mean, yeah. that, that was my problem because he never sort of defended me. It was like, oh, well, Jeff, you know, they've asked me for, to do this, you do that. And as we well know, the biggest achievement was the, the Dalai Lama vocal for Tomorrow Never Knows with the revolving speaker, right? I mean, how the hell do you achieve the Dalai Lama singing on a mountaintop 25 miles away from the studio, right? <laughs> with nothing. So luckily, as everyone knows, my saving grace was the revolving speaker. You know, I saw from the Hammond organ, the B3, well, I thought, well, if we can cut into the circuitry and put John's voice through that revolving speaker, maybe we'll give him what he wants. And because we did, and he was just ecstatic, you know. Also, the fact of lowering the drum mics on Ringo's drum sound. So that's where it all started to develop. All right. So let's you backtrack know. for one second, because Revolver is your first big engineering. Yes, because I, I was fam a familiar face with them because, you know, I was a second engineer on, on all the, a lot of the singles like She Loves You and The Help and all the rest of the, some, a lot of the, the solo recordings, you know. And then I'm suddenly promoted to be their recording engineer because Norman left. You know? But I actually started like five months prior to doing Revolver because the first thing I ever, and everyone was objecting to the fact that my young kid becoming their new recording engineer at Abbey Road Studios, or EMI Studios, as it was then. 
So the first, and I was taking over Norman Smith's sessions because Norman wanted to become a producer. So he left. And because we had a good sort of good relationship, George Martin and I and Norman and so forth. So the first thing I ever recorded as, as a recording engineer was Pretty Flamingo by, by Manfred Mann. And that was the first time, I, as an experiment, I put a, a, a dobro guitar through a Fairchild 660. And no one had ever heard any guitar with so much presence in their lives. So that sort of helped to make that a hit, you know. And so the, the higher ups at EMI are having a fit. Yes, <laughs> yes, yeah. But also, of course, being a mastering engineer prior to that and being so young, I knew certain things could be achieved, right? I couldn't go along with the rules and re regulations and the protocol of a studio that wasn't willing to expand or progress itself, you know, which was a corporation. Right. Now, because I tell you, just to inter interject something, even on the classical side, because EMI was a classical recording organization, they couldn't compete with Deutsche Grammophon on the sound of the classical records. And that was a big problem to them. So I know it was also behind the scenes a big discussion why don't add our classical recordings have the brightness and the depth of Deutsche Grammophon. So I'm obviously in my own way trying to improve the pop side, you know? Right. Looking back on it. Right, and uh, Revolver, I mean, Revolver is 1966. Yes. Now, now, do you have a sense of perspective from 1962 to 1966, how much had changed in the sound of everything that happened. Right now, it seems like, uh, you know, it's, it's just a couple of years, but it was lifetimes of change in a matter of a couple of years from I Want to Hold Your Hand to Tomorrow Never Knows are completely different worlds. Were you aware of that in the moment, or did it just... No, not really, because yeah. when Rubber Soul was being recorded, I was in the mastering room, and I didn't really hear any of the tracks from Rubber Soul at that point. And, until it was issued. Um, so I know there was a big gap for me and I was doing what I'm thinking about up in the mastering room about new sounds and so forth. But nothing really changed, you know. There was Cliff Richard and the Shadows and they recalled this way and that way. And this is the way we mic the drums and this is the way we do this. And it's, as the Beatles always said, we don't want that wishy-washy sound, which is not disrespectful, you know. It was the sound of the, of the music from, from, from England in those days, you know. Because no one sort of had, and I'm not sort of making myself look, look bigger here, but I had an ear for something that could be better, you know. And we were always told that the EMI equipment was much better than anything in the world. I did not realise how Tamla created their bass sounds. I know a lot of it was the musicians and what equipment they had and how they recorded it. And I was always trying to achieve that Tamla bass sound on anything I could record in Abbey Road, and I couldn't, you know. So that was a, my big sort of fight all the time. Mm. Even to the fact, you know, of using a loudspeaker as a microphone to try and, in theory, you know, get, get that depth in that bass. And I could never, 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 ever, ever achieve it. The guys in the white coats were common. Well, <laughs> they were the white coats. I mean, they were just the maintenance guys. And you couldn't relate to them anyway because they didn't have ears and there was a technical way of doing things. And, no, you, Jeff, you can't do that. You can't do this. You can't do this. Well, I could do it after hours, you know. Because if the manager had come in, <coughs> if the manager had come in, I would have been, I, I could have been fired many times, I know that. But I think the Beatles would have give, given me the defence, you know. Right. I mean, which happened with the bass drum situation, with the microphone going nearer to the bass drum and the front skin coming off. And, you know, you, can, you, you weren't allowed to put the microphone closer than 18 inches to the bass drum because it's going to destroy the diaphragm. And I ended up with six inches away from the, the bass drum you know, and get this wonderful new bass drum sound, you know, which Ringo was like in awe of it, you know, and so was everyone else. I mean, every, like Phil Collins and, and Jeff Picaro said to me, Jeff, you know, he said, he said, if, if I hadn't heard that drum sound on Tomorrow Never Knows, we would never become drummers. They did not realize that the tonalities of the drums could sound the way they did. I know we're going back, you know, to the 60s, but it inspired them to become drummers. It wasn't drums in the distance, keeping time, you know. Now, settle this argument. Paul seems to have a, uh, a sense of, he was the one who brought the avant-garde stuff into the Beatles. John always said he was the avant-garde one, and Paul's trying to sort of reclaim that now. From your perspective, who was on that cutting edge, or were they together doing it? Well, if we're, if we're, if we're going to the musicality of, of, of the way we recorded that, that music, um, First of all, you know, John was John. He was a bit, 
you know, he was fine. He wasn't a perf perfectionist, right? And Paul developed into a perfectionist as a musician. And I always call Paul the musician's musician because when he you know, tied up with Jane Asher, who came from a classical background, it gave him an insight into music per se. And the weird thing I found out afterwards was the fact both he and I, when we were seven years old, used to like the Brandenburg concertos for whatever reason, right? Um, so anyway, he, um, he was the guy that was like, like pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing for perfection. John, being John, would say, oh, 95%, that's fine, because we never did edits when we did the basic rhythm tracks on any of our songs, right? And if anyone screwed up like three bars from the end with a wrong note, we didn't do an edit piece. We went right back to the beginning and rec recorded the whole track again. So we never edited anything. So everything you hear is basically a real performance. It's not like today, you know. But that, that's the magic of a lot of those tracks, you know, the energy and so forth. And, and mistakes used to happen on those basic rhythm tracks, which were finished sounds. We didn't do it on the mix. Everything was in its final finished stage. And someone may be play a wrong note. Oh, that's wonderful. So we elaborate on that. So that's how all these diverse arrangements of these songs happened. They never came in with an arrangement. It was a song and a piece of paper. And that's where it started from. Now, when you come into engineering Revolver and Sgt. Pepper, we're getting into the hallucinogenic stage huh. of, of the fabs. <laughs> <laughs> was no, there a noticeable Not me, no, no, not me. In, <laughs> in fact, no. no. In fact, we were very ignorant of that. In fact, Richard, who was my assistant, we weren't ignorant of it because we were like kids, right? But George Martin was. But we used to know, as soon as I used to light Joss sticks down in the studio, that something was coming out, right? Which is normally the plot. And obviously, that, the, the drug thing did develop, you know, through, through the, the months, I guess. Um, uh, so, but, but George was ignorant of it, and Richard and I knew that, you know, something was going on, and they had their own little sort of cubicle space down in number two studio where they sort of hide behind there and do whatever they wanted to do. And obviously, I think the, anything excessive of, 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 of pot or anything like that was done outside in clubs in London, which we, we weren't familiar with. We, we were working with a corporation. There's no way we could indulge in anything like that. The only thing I found out was from Jerry Beckley in America, once he, he said, I saw Mal Evans once, and he said, Mal Evans was actually putting uppers in our tea at three o'clock in the morning, <laughs> and, and, which kept George Martin awake, right? Because, of, because of, obviously, no, because George was running Air Studios as a company and he had other artists. So often we'd be sitting there because, first of all, the producer was not allowed to touch the mixing console, right? That was taboo in, in, in rules and regulations. He had to sit by his little table, little chair, and often, you know, George would just nod off and fall asleep, right? So we're, we're supposed to be recording a track, right? And, and then Mal realized what was going on and you have to put an upper in a cup of tea, you know, to wake George up, you know? <laughs> did did uh, those regulations loosen up over time where George could actually... No. 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 No, he just slept. No, it, no, it, no, it, no, it's not true. It was a fact he was running the, the air organization. And when it got to three and four in the morning, I mean, he, obviously he had to leave. And then just Richard and I used to carry on the session, you know? Yeah. Then, then you get into the midst of Sgt. Pepper. Now, there's a break in between because the, the whole media thing was the Beatles have dried up, they've disappeared for five months, what happened? And this Sgt. Pepper thing is being planned. This Well, what happened, we, done, re, we, we recorded the Revolver album and they'd gone on a tour and they tried to recreate some of the tracks off the Revolver album live and it was absolutely impossible. And there was a lot of backlash from different venues that they tried, tried to, to do venues in, especially a lot of things in, in South America somewhere where the, it was sort of running down the runway, being chased by people and stuff. So anyway, we come into the, the, the first session of the, of the uh, Sgt. Pepper album. So we're all waiting there and they come in and then, then John Lennon makes the announcement to everybody that we're never going to tour again. This is the first time they've ever made that statement. So John's saying, well, you know, we're going to concentrate on a record that's going to have sounds on it and ways of recording and stuff that we know we're never, ever, ever going to have to produce live. There's no way we can because there's nothing, no facilities to do that. So, of course, everyone looks at me and I'm thinking, well, you know, what, what am I supposed to do? I've got like two tape machines <laughs> and an eight input mixing console and an echo chamber, you know. So from that moment on, because we knew that, that Revolver was special because of probably... 
the impact of the, some of the sounds, especially the guitar sounds, which of course was the Fairchild 660, which no one else had ever used on, on guitars. So anyway, so I, it was now a um, dressing down of that sort of sound and now trying to be subtle in creating you know, really different sounds. Um, for instance, miking the piano from underneath, um, going absurd with the equalization from two outside in equalizers, which was the RS-127, which was like plus 10 or minus 10 at, at 2.7 or 10K or three, or three and a half. And sometimes I'd, put, I'd look those up in series. So some of the harmony vocals would be like 30 dBs at 2.7 on a broad curve. Um, but just to give effects and different sounds, which no one, of course, have never heard before. And I know, I know we can talk about this forever, but on a day in the life, the, it came to, I think, track number four or five. Every time we recorded a track, th that, the next track was going to sound better or be better than the track before, even though the track before sounded fantastic. So we're now going to approach it in a different way, but make it even more fantastic than the next track. So it got to a point like four or five tracks into the, the recording. Um, and it came to a day in the life, and this was going to be the most ultimate drum sound, right? So what, what I did on the drums, I'm, you know, my mind's sort of sh you know, doing this, so what do I do, what do I do, right? So what I did on the toms on the day in the life, I took the bottom skins off the toms and got dynamic mics and wrapped them in a, like a tea towel to hold them into a Pyrex jug underneath all the toms. And my theory was that you know, the top mic with the hit is the impact of the stick hitting the top skin, but the tonality comes from the bottom skin, which is not there anymore. It's the resonance of the drum. So that's how I did the drums on a day in the life. So I'm trying to create you know, new stuff all the time, but of course at the time, that drum sound was like awesome. No one had ever heard a drum sound like that. Now it's just commonplace, I guess, you know? So all the time I'm just under pressure, 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 pressure. And the work effort was really good, and, but the rewards were enormous because of the, what, what we put into every track. I mean, it, I mean, looking back on it, I mean, it really was. It's the end of a session, whether it's two weeks finishing a track off, but you could just sit back and sigh and think, my God, look what we've done. And I, I, I mean, I, I guess this can happen today in some instances with the way people record. But we're trying to create our own things. We don't use plugins. We don't, I still don't use plugins. I just still create and create and create, you know. You have to go through an analog mixing console and probably mix to, to, to analog. But, all, but it's like, you know, pa painting a picture. You're either going to paint by numbers or you're going to put individual brush strokes on it. So once you start painting by numbers, you're using plugins, you know. I, I can't work like this. It's an artistic creation of music. And that's, that's what we did, you know. And we used to invite, you know, bands who were in other studios within EMI, like the like the Hollies or someone else that was recording there, and say, "Come, we'll play you a couple of our new tracks, right?" So Richard, you know, who's my assistant, we're sitting there knowing what we're going to see because we know what we've just created, and you see these bands come in and they're just open mouthed and destroyed because they <laughs> no because they know damn well there's no they don't know what they've just heard. And they've got no idea how they could ever recreate it. Right, we, we call that the Brian Wilson effect. No, I know. And, and also, you know, that, that time when we did that monitor mix for a day in the life, Ron Richards, who was a Hollies producer, was sitting down on the floor here. I'm at the mixing console. And Ron's listening to this playback. This was muff, m rough monitor mix of a day in the life. And Ron's got his head in his hands, right? He said, I'm going to give the business up. I can't, there's no way I can ever, 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 ever do what you've just done. And, you know, that's the way we, it, you know, it was this creation of stuff, you know. So that, that was, it's a longer story and the piano chord and all the rest of it. Anyway. <laughs> well, yeah, well, we could talk about it all night, you know, now, which you don't want to. I know. Three, three pianos at the end, right? Four. Four. And a harpsichord. And a harpsichord. And, uh, and a, um, uh, right. harmonium. Right. There's a right. slight buzz underneath that original thing. Right. But when they decided in their wisdom to try and clean it up, the buzz of the harmonium, which was George Martin, just going zzz, like whatever, they cleaned it up and that sort of diminished. And the other thing that's diminished, because when we did the uh, piano overdub at the end, as we all know that Ringo moved his foot at the end and made a squeak, and then McCartney looked at him and was like, my God, what have you just done, right? Because the, the level of the microphones was so intense that you, you could hear a pin drop, right? 
So he moved his foot and you hear, Ee! but I, over the years that's just gone because it went into infinity. It, I never faded it. It just went, that whole piano chord just went into a f infinity and then the noise level gradually came back. So that's now gone when they've tried to clean these records up, you know, which is a shame. You know? now, now whose idea for the uh, inner groove to run endlessly and the, and the uh, dog frequency? It, it, was, <laughs> it was a last minute decision, John being John. They used to love going down to the microphone and singing their vocals. And it's almost the end of the album and it's like all sequenced when it ends. And then John said, oh, you know, let, let's do um, gob gobbledygook. And I think it goes from gobbledygook, which is on the, on the, on the concentric, right? Mm. So the first thing, it goes on the, on the run-out spiral. And John said, let's, uh, let, let's annoy the dogs. So, <laughs> so we'll put like a 15K or 16K frequency on there, right? Which makes the dog's ears per, you know, perk up. <laughs> and then we'll just go into this gobbledygook, gobbledygook thing, uh, which was they, they just ran down the stairs and just said whatever they said, blah, 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 And that was the end of it. There's no in, uh, messages in there or nothing. It was just, just garbage. Just and that was the concentric. But it meant that when Harry Moss, who mastered the, the, the B-side of the record, depending on where you put the, st the point down to cut the master, it has to end up on the concentric. And it took him nine times to a actually get it right. Mm. Because if you put the point down at the wrong point, the concentric does, does, doesn't uh, marry up. Now, now, you had a rule about when you were engineering about mastering yes, that oh, you well, had a certain way of well, telling the, uh, the, the master well, what to do. No. <laughs> well, yeah, because I'd been a mastering engineer and we knew when we'd finished Pe 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 uh, Pepper that we, because of the efforts that had gone into it from every aspect of every person involved with it, i.e. being the mono, which is the definitive mix of, of Pepper and, and all the Beatle recordings, right? We didn't want it touched because we knew every little nuance, every tonality. Anyway, I, I wrote on the box, please transfer flat. I'd been a mastering engineer, right? So it's not like someone who doesn't know about mastering has written this. And when the manager got the box, he went absolutely berserk. He was chasing me around the building. <laughs> no, I'm serious. He was red in the face. He was screaming my name. And he said, how dare you, how dare you write this on this box telling my mastering engineers to do their job? I said, look, I said, look, we've lived with this album for so many weeks now, it's nearly finished. We just don't want it touched. So it was then, I was then given permission to sit in with the mastering engineer, which was Harry Moss, right? Um, that had never happened before. You weren't allowed as an engineer to go into the mastering engineer's room while he's mastering your record. So anyway, they gave me permission to sit in with Harry, and I think it was one track, we added like one dB at 10K on, and that was the end of it, and it was just mastered flat. But, it, but you know, we're breaking barriers down all the, all the time, you know? Mm. There's nothing wrong with an engineer going in with, with a mastering engineer. Then it was taboo. No way do you go in there and just say, you know, can you do this and do that, you know? Were there any rules you didn't break? It's just no, <laughs> none. <laughs> Across the board, just break them all. No, I know. So 67, the Beatles are still acting as a cohesive unit. Uh, we get into 68 in the White Album and things take a drastic turn. What was the facilitating? Well, I mean, yes, I mean, I, I know we're going to forget Let It Be because that's yeah. the whole, what it, forget it. I mean, um, the White Album, they, they'd been to India at that, that point and um, they came back, we started to do the White Album, and they came, as far as we're concerned, we're sitting in the control room, they're coming back into the control room to start the beginning of the White Album. And they're like completely different people that you've never seen in your lives. They're gaunt, they're dressed really weird. So we start like routine a song. I've got no idea even what the first song was. And it was like, not a nightmare, but you know, the guitar amps were turned up, you know, the, the leaky johns from the guitar amps to the drum mics and the this and that, and the piano was picking up all this stuff. And there was like a lot of anger there that I, I detected, because don't forget I've been with them since 1962 up to that point, right? And so I'm detecting anger here and there's something wrong. And it was only like a few weeks later that certain things started to leak out into the newspapers as to what had transpired in India which wasn't really a nice situation, right? I, I can't even remember what those things were, but it wasn't nice. And plus the fact that they were now starting the Apple organization, which had a lot of problems. Anyway, I think after 11 tracks, uh, I, I walked out. Um, they ended up, 
from eight tracks onwards, maybe like Harrison was in number one studio. I was doing Blackbird with, with Paul in number two. Um, John was somewhere else in number three and they used maintenance engineers as engineers. Um, it wasn't really a nice experience and one thing led to another and, and John could, uh, could be really sort of nasty sometimes. I mean, he obviously had some problems. I don't know what those problems were, right? Um, he could be aggressive and a bit nasty. So it came to a point when it came to the distorted guitar solo on Revolution Number no. 9. And he said, made a nasty remark to me one night. And I thought, right, I can't swear at you because you're the artist, right? And he said, I want this, this distorted guitar sound, like something you've never created before. I don't know whether that was correct words or not. So he's got like a regular guitar sound out of, out of his box amp, and I've got a U47 mic. So I went into the first mic amp on the desk, which we're not allowed to touch, right? And I wound it up f flat out on the side of the desk, came out of that mic amp, went into another mic amp, wound that flat out, I went out to another mic amp, because this is all tube equipment, right? I went into a third mic amp and wound that flat out, and the distortion level, until I lifted the, I didn't know what I was gonna hear. And out of anger, I said, is that what you want? And lifted the fader up, and of course it was. It was the most <laughs> un 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 unbelievable distorted guitar sound, but it was created out of anger. My anger, you know? And it, 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 which, I mean, if you'd been there that night, you would have realized that no one had ever heard a distorted guitar sound like that in their lives. It was like awesome. All the bottom end was distorting, the top end, the mid end, because it, it was tube equipment. It was like, Christ, you know? So anyway, that happened, and I, as I said, that guitar sound was created out of anger. Anyway, a few, few days later, certain things were happening, and I, I said to Jules Martin on this particular Tuesday, we, we Paul had tried to sing, obla-di, obla-da, whatever, for seventh time. So anyway, cut long story short, I said to George, I'm leaving, I can't, I can't take this anymore, there's so much crap going on down here, right? So George said, well, this was on a Tuesday, and he said, well, can you stay till Friday? And I said, no. So we went up to see the manager, and then we came back down, and they knew something was going on because they were trying to communicate with the control room, and they were in the studio. So I went downstairs, you know, down to see them, and I was talking to John and, I, and George, because George never really sort of backed back me up on anything, because he didn't want to lose his position, right? And although the Beatles were in control, he wasn't going to defend me because in case anything went a little bit funny. So George is still George, right? Who's not in control. So anyway, you know, so George said, well, Jeff's got something to say to you, right? And I said, yeah, I'm leaving, right? So John, I, sometimes when things are going funny on sessions, you think, that it's sometimes it's your fault, right? For whatever reason, it's not, you, you know, they're com commenting on what you're trying to do, they don't realize what you're trying to do, they feel you're not trying to help and so forth, and all there are other problems. So John said, no, Jeff, it's not, not you, it's this, meaning number two Abbey Road Studios, which is not really conducive to making records. It's bricks on the wall, industrial lighting, no colored lights, a couple of seats with springs sticking out of them, and an angle poise lens, lamp. So they've been sort of incarcerated in this facility for like three or four months on and off. So John said, no, it's not you, Jeff, you know, it's just all this. So anyway, I, so I'm thinking, well, okay, you've said that now, John, to me. So I'm thinking maybe I will stay knowing you've just said that. But then he made a nasty remark to Paul McCartney about the, the Sgt. Pepper album, uh, which I'm not gonna say what it was. And then I thought, no, forget it. I'm not gonna carry on with this. So then I, I, walk, I walked out and that was it, you know. Did you leave EMI? No, no, I was still no. there. And then Ken Scott was dragged out of the mastering room because he was like a, a subsidiary mastering engineer because he was a familiar face on some of the sessions because he was an assistant. And Ke although Ken, I believe, at that time was a mastering engineer, and they dragged him out of his mastering room that, uh, that afternoon and plonked him in my chair. And Richard, who was my assistant, said, you know, he shit himself, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so... Excuse the language, but no, no, he did. He he did not didn't know what to do. I mean, all the mic setups were done. You know, he didn't have to do anything because all the sounds were there. But he's like the only one that said he had a ball and a blast making the White Album. McCartney said it was the worst experience of his life. And the other thing was, when I left, George Martin said to me, he said, you know, Jeff, if I wasn't going on holiday in two weeks' time, I would have done exactly what you've done there and walked out on this situation. And he didn't, you know which he could have done, you know? 68. Tell but I was called back to do Abbey Road, of yeah. course. Uh, bef before Abbey Road, tell us a little bit about 
the wonderful innovations and the studio that Magic Alex was putting together. What was the whole deal with that guy? No, well, I mean, the whole thing, well, <laughs> that's a long story. I mean, uh, the studio was, was, well, it wasn't usable. I mean, there was even no, no porthole to put microphone connections through into the studio. The mixing console was this concept of um, eight faders stuck in a 10 foot wide piece of wood speakers all around the room. He had eight right. speakers right. In, in front of you, each one for, for, one, one for eight tracks, and a, and, a, and a green blipping oscilloscope, whatever that did, I've got, I, I just don't know, right? <laughs> so they, they start to do the Let It Be album down there. Obviously this facility doesn't work. So they got the, the, the uh, EMI mixing console down, the portable one from Abbey Road, to, to go into the, into the uh, App, Apple Studios. Um, and that's what they used to start it with, and then I think they went to Twickenham, right? Um, but anyway, cut long story short, Paul phoned up and said, look, because I, I couldn't further myself with e in EMI, right? I'd, I'd gone to a certain point, I was so young, what do I do, sit in a room for 50 years? Like, no, no way, right? So I was going to George Martin's new studio or, or the, the, the joint Apple, and I said to Paul, as you know, the studio doesn't function because it's useless. So it was a bit of a fight, so I gutted the whole studio, right? And it took like two years to build the new Apple Studio. So there's not many d documentations and pictures not of this all, studio. No. There's a few that fly around. And it was a commercial studio for another two years. I mean, I made some wonderful albums down right. there. Steeler's Wheel was done in there. Steeler's Wheel right. I did, and, and Tim Hardin, right. and an old girl band called Fanny. Right. Um, many, many nice albums were made down there. Well, and was, was Badfinger done? At no, Apple? I did that no. in Air Studios. Okay. Um, yeah. But it was most the mastering room that we had was the best in Europe. It was awesome. And the mastering engineer I actually took from Ab Abbey Road, Malcolm. Um, so anyway, that, that led up in, 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 into the Apple Studios situation. Um, but it was a, an absolute disaster. From, that's another, John was just, and I'm not, I keep going back to John, right? So Magic Alex said to, to John one day, because he was telling me all sorts of things, you know, there's this magic paint, right? So I'm gonna paint your house with this magic paint, so when you wake up tomorrow, it's gonna to be blue, right? So you're gonna wake up the next day and it's gonna be green, right? So, but John's believing all this stuff, right? Because Magic Alec used, used to look at all these technical books and stuff, whatever was suggested. So he's now telling John that he's gonna, this is really true, that he's gonna build an invisible flying saucer for him. <laughs> right? And then John kept saying to him, because we moved the, their development department to a place called Boston, Boston Place down by Marylebone Station in London because we were building the studios down in Savile Row. So John kept saying to Magic Alex, well, you know, when, when are we going to see the, or not see the invisible <laughs> flying saucer, right? I don't know how he correctly worded it to Magic <laughs> Alex, right? When are you going to unveil it, I think it was, right? So anyway, so he, kept, he was under pressure and he said, oh, it's going to be next Wednesday, right? So the night before next Wednesday was a fire in his workshop, right? So this invisible flying saucer was destroyed. <laughs> <laughs> and, and John believed it. <laughs> 68, same, it seemed like a crazy time with, with, with the madness going on at Apple. And then how does one, like the Abbey Road album comes out in 69. Yes. Yeah. Phil McDonald gets credited as being the engineer in the album. And you may have something to say about well, yeah. um, uh, what actually happened there, why he's credited on it, and what you did well, his work on it. Well, yeah, I mean, we're both credited, but what happened, I'd worked at Abbey Road for, I don't know, I don't know nine years, up until, was it 69, 68, when the album came out? 69, right. Yeah. So I, I left to join Apple as, as you know, the Apple man. So... Then Paul says, you know, we're going to record a new album, which was to become the Abbey Road album. So the sessions are booked into Abbey Road. And Abbey Road said, well, Jeff can't do it. He's an independent engineer after nine years. So I'm going to back into the same studio I've worked in for nine years. Oh, no, we don't allow independent engineers, right? So there's a huge discussion happens. So Phil McDonald, who was my assistant, and also, also could do, do, do some engineering, it was agreed because I think it was a financial thing that one of their engineers wasn't going to earn the income from doing the sessions. So Phil was like, uh, my, still my assistant, but he used to sit up in the front of the, of the, the studio in the, in the foyer just to get, get his salary. But also, of course, 
give him credit, when I was working on the studio at the same time, he used to take over some of the sessions. Uh, but the other thing that, that, that was uh, sorted out with management, because I, was, you know, I wasn't involved with these discussions, that I couldn't have my name on the tape boxes or the recording sheets. Uh, which is, I mean, when you think about it, it's so disgusting. After working for, for Abbey Road for nine years, you know, and you come back like two weeks later, and you're not allowed in the studio because you're now independent. It's a fabulously engineered album. And well, yeah, and that's yeah. when we first went in, into the uh, transistorized world because of the Red 51 desk being the tube desk, which had all that, that clout and punch. Um, and when we, they brought the TG desk in, which had beautiful facilities on it with selectable equalization and compressors and limiters and so forth, um, and many inputs in, into the mixing console because there's no mono version of Abbey Road, it was recorded for stereo for the first time. And it gave me the luxury of being able to record drums in stereo. Um, but what happened when we first lifted the faders up, we couldn't get the same punch on the bass drum or the snare sound or the guitars or the bass. And we're sort of down in the mouth for like three, three days. And I said, well, why can't we get the, you know, get the original mixing console then? Well, we can't, you know. So anyway, we sort of, sort of accepted the fact that this is what we, we're now recording with, but of course it's got the most magical organic texture to that album, which again was, the concept of that was like, it just came into being, you know, because if, if those original rhythm tracks on, on um, Abbey Road had been recorded through the tube desk, they would have had so much more punch, um, and consequently all the overdubs would have had more punch to actually complement the original punch in the basic rhythm tracks. So that album would never, never, ever sound the way it sounds. And it was just a, listening to it, you know, recently, it's just the most beautiful sort of sound, you know, which was sort of, again, I guess, it, you know, get, getting into the artistic value of this, say all the, all the other albums that were recorded through the Red 51 desk were painted in oil colours, which had more depth a more pigment. Maybe you can say the Abbey Road album was done more in watercolours. That's the only way I can describe it. There's so much more depth. In, it wasn't just like vivid colours. It was more depth in, in the tonalities of, of the instruments. That's the only, only way I can describe that. Right. Yeah. And then Paul brings you back for 1973, brings you back for Band on the Run. Oh, don't. Um, <laughs> now, did you, did you have to go to Lagos? Yeah, you know I did. Uh, I mean... Uh, okay, well, I, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, EMI had, because th th this was like after I'd left Apple, because I was at Apple for four years, Paul had no involvement by going to the studios at Apple or going into the building, basically. So we had no sort of contact for like four years. As soon as I left there and rejoined George Martin's studio, Paul phoned up and said, you know, do you want to come and do a new album? And EMI Studios had like studios worldwide. And the only... Maybe this is a wrong conception of it. So I think there was a list of like 50 studios that EMI had worldwide, India and Pakistan and Russia and Poland. And someone just put their finger down their thing with their eyes shut and it stopped at Lagos or Lagos, right? So that's where, that's where we went. And as you, I, I think, you know, the day before we left, the band split up. Um, so we, there's like three of us, you know? And we sort of, we go and... Um, Paul gets mugged. He got, mugged, he got some of his de demos taken, as we all know. And we got to EMI Studios in Lagos, which, which still had like open drainage and lepers and it was monsoon land. And it was, it was just horrible, right? But we anyway, we ended up there. And, you, you know, if you go to that sort of facility, you'd make the best of it. You don't say, oh, I need these speakers, these microphones. And you don't, you just use what you're given. So there was a cardboard box full of microphones, which I used... There were no acoustic screens, so we had to make our own, and Paul sort of helped out, because he was quite you know, good at that with hammer and nails. And So we all mucked in and made these acoustic screens. And I think the tape machine was an eight-track uh, Studer, which only had like four sync amps in it, and I had to keep moving the sync amps and so forth. So anyway, we ended up with the album after, after like five, five weeks. And the bass, I, I mean, if you listen to it tonality-wise or musically, the, the, the main focal point of the album is the drum sound, and I never tried to lose the drum sound. Everything was complementary to the drums on that. Um, I, I don't know whether people listen to things like that, but it is, the drums are really, really loud, and they sort of carry the whole thing. So you know, we, we went back to, to London after five weeks and, and, and finished it off. And I was due to 
do, do another album with a, I think the band was called Triumvirate with, with uh, a guy I produced called Jerry Braun. And my manager at that time, John Burgess, said, look, you know, Paul, Jeff's come back and he wants like a few more days. Can you give up three of your days so he can mix band on the run? And Jerry said, no. So at that time, Paul was going to kidnap me. And then, then this is a true story. Paul said, well, I'm going to kidnap you, Jeff, and we're just going to go away and somewhere and mix the album. Anyway, eventually, I, I actually mixed the album in three days at a studio called Kingsway in London. And it was, it was really good. I mean, the decisions were made. We mixed it, and that was it. There was no, you know, head in our hands thinking, oh, the guitar doesn't sound right for four days. We just mixed it, you know, and it took three days to mix the album. So that, on Band on the Run, you know? Out, out of the worst circumstances comes... Probably could have been one of Paul's best albums, arguably. Yes, I know, because I know when in, in certain discussions with Paul, you know, he always says, oh, you know, I played Band on the Run last night. Oh, it still sounds great, you know. And you think, well, why don't we do another one, you know? <laughs> well, it's not like you weren't involved with him in any more albums. You no, were, uh, had a part in Venus and Mars, Speed of Sound, yeah. Run, Devil, Run, London Town, McCartney 2, Tug of War, Pipes of Peace, Broad Street. Uh, Flowers pie. in the Dirt, Flaming Paul's pie. Live. It's just it's a big list of albums that you had uh, worked on with me, either either mixing or And Flaming Pie, which was like the disastrous part. I, the, my, one of my favorites, you know. Yeah. With Jeff Lynne, of course, producing, which right. was great, you know. Yeah. I want to get to the, like, the Jeff Lynne, Free as a Bird stuff in a minute. Oh, yeah, before yeah, yeah. that, yeah, yeah. Uh, a question I had was, tell us a little bit about the sessions for all those years ago, which isn't really documented anywhere that... Paul wasn't actually, may have like flown his vocal in or something. No, you're going to have to remind yeah. me. So, remind me. Uh, well, you're, original the, the song called All Those Years Ago. Right, right? Like, that okay. you engineered. Right? Yes, yes. Which was the big Beatles reunion after John had passed away. Um, okay. 80, 1981. We're talking about Free as a Bird or not? No. no? Um, all Those Years Ago. So we're talking right. about, about either Pipes of Peace George or Harrison, Tug of War, right? right? We're talking 19... 80, 81, George Harrison. So Paul, what album Paul, are we working on? Uh, George we... is working on Somewhere in England, but he brought Paul and Ringo and Denny Lane in to do this tribute to John, which you had engineered. Right, but, but we were doing it, I know, right. I, you're reminding me, but yeah. we were doing it at Air Studios, obviously, right? Uh, it may have been uh, and Harrison it was... Studio. No. No? Um, no, I don't. Yes, it could have been, because I know what, F you know, yeah. what happened... We were working on whatever album we were working on at that time. Must be Tug of War, maybe. I don't know. Pipes of Peace, right? Tug of War, yeah. So out of like respect to 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 John and who'd been passed away, so we we went down to to George's studio at Friar Park, right? And we hadn't seen each other for a long time, and neither I don't think had Paul done. So it was like a reunion thing, and I think we obviously did. You, you know more than I do about it. It's a long, long time ago. Thank so we went down to George's studio, and I think we worked on that track there. Um, but I think we came back to Air Studios after that, and Paul did whatever Paul wanted to do on that track. I think yeah. we laid down the basic track at George's studio at, at Friar Park. Right. And then we came, came back and, and, and finished it off with the, whatever Paul wanted to add, add to it. And I think that's what happened then. We, it was a basic track from scratch... Uh, I don't know who the composers are. I don't know. It's well, George, that's George's song. Yeah, okay. So, um, so, so that's what happened. Right. And Paul didn't even play bass on it. That's Herbie it, Flowers. That's, yes, that's right. Yes, yes, it, so. yes. But, yeah. uh, I, I just wanted to lead into that because... No, that's uh, very good yeah, because it's yeah. something I've, I've completely forgotten about, you know. Right. And then, because uh, that would have been like the first... Beatles reunion kind of thing. Well, uh, yeah, I mean... You know, no, even it, though Denny Lane is on it and Linda... Which right, would have happened you know, at Air Studios, but right. not at George's studio at that right. particular time. It was just okay. Paul, George, and me, and I think Phil McDonald's right. working there, and the, the percussion right. guy that died, uh, that died um, you know, the great... Ray Cooper was Ray on Ray Cooper was on right. it, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But, That's right. Uh, yeah, but there's some pictures of you actually at the session with George Martin, which I thought was interesting. Yeah, George was there too. So, yes. George had a hand in all those years ago somewhere, or he was just... I can't remember. Around, so. I can't remember. Yeah, <laughs> So, yeah, just around. But yeah, <laughs> no, it, that's a hard one for me to talk about. But you so, know, uh, let me ask one more before we get to the crowd. Uh, we got what about free of the free, free as a bird? bird. Uh, tell us about real love, free as a bird, and well, the uh, mystery track. 
that they did. Don't say Carnival of Light. No. The one, the one at the Free as the Bird Sessions. <laughs> Which was, well, the B-side, and there was well, another song, right? Then there's right? a third song they did that. Which was, like, useless. We never it's, heard. Because so. Paul said to... Now and then... Well, let's go, go, yeah. well, let's go to the end of those sessions. Right. And there was this, like, thing that, that was like a half of a verse or a half of a chorus. And, and Paul said oh, to, to George, he said, well... You know, um, do you want to finish this song? And Jules said, I, I'm, I'm not interested. And that was the end of that. Yeah. So what happened on, on Free as a Bird? We know the situation is this, this vocal on a cassette. And we go down to, to Paul's studio in Sussex, right? And how many years is it from the end of the Abbey Road sessions to that point? A lot of years, not right? 1969 to 19. They recorded that in 94. Oh, 90, right. 94. So late 94. Ringo turns up, yeah. the drum kits sit there in, in, in Paul's studio, and yeah. it was really weird because um, it was like we just finished the Abbey Road session two weeks prior to that because I used to call Ringo Ring, right? And then George was George, whatever he was called, right? And so we had this, like, conversation... We had secret... Not secret words, but just words and conversations that we could connect with each other. So I thought this is really weird. It was like we finished the Abbey Road album two weeks ago, and they were doing Free as a Bird. You know, and the, the problem... Well, it wasn't a problem. It, I know people have gone berserk about the way that, well, that, that vocal track on that cassette was, like, translated to a, in time to another track. It wasn't really that hard. And then, you know, we did it, and it, to me, it was one of the best guitar solos that, that Harrison had ever fucking recorded, you know? <laughs> No, I mean, but it was, and I, and I know one time we were in um, in, in uh, Idaho, we were working with Steve uh, Miller, and we were working on, this was after we'd finished recording it, and we had a copy of it, and we were in Steve Miller's studio and in, in uh, Sun Valley, and we put it on, and Paul's children were there, and I was there, and we played it, and everyone burst into tears. It was, no, really, right. the, the, the actual... Now, now Paul, has, Paul has threatened to put that third song out. He says if he can put it together. Now, yeah. now and then it was called, yeah. Yeah, but it's like two words. Is it know? now and then? <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it, I, that Free as a Bird is the most beautiful track and ever. How was the tension between George and Paul after all those years? Having Jeff Lynn on the session, being in George's Well, no, camp. no, no, no. Can we, you, you know, yeah, story. Was, well, the first yeah, thing was, well, right. George want, wanted um, um, Jeff Lynn to produce it, right? And then Paul said, well, if you want Jeff Lynn, I want Jeff Emmerich to actually record it. Yeah, here you go. So that was the, the confliction. Because, you know, it was a, not, wasn't a weird situation with Harrison and the other people. They were very suspicious of us because we, they were from Liverpool, right? And we were from, like, the south of England. And we were supposed to be the really rich people, right? Which we weren't, right? So there was this sort of dividing line. They were very suspicious of us. And... Anyway, that, that's, what, that's what happened. So, you know, Paul said, well, Jeff Emmerich's going to record it if you want Jeff Lynn to produce it. But, you know, it ended up being the most be beautiful record ever. And when you actually analyse that record, you know. Mm. And then, that, as you know, that third one was less, like a nothing thing, you know. I thought you were going to mention Carnival of Light. That was no, it. no. Well. <laughs> which everyone <laughs> asks about, which is a jam session, right? Because I saw Paul about three months ago and I said, you know, Remind me about Carnival of Light, because I can't remember about it. He said, well, it was a jam session one night. It was like a, a load of crap, you know? So people are really <laughs> going to be disappointed if they ever well, actually Well, it was. It, it was a jam session, yeah. and if you want to do something with it, do something with it. It was nothing, you know, controlled or, you know, worked on. It was just a jam session, for God's sake, you know? All right, let's uh, take some questions. Anybody have a uh, question for Jeff? Right here. Yes, all, their, all those Beatle recordings up to the Abbey Road album were, were remixed and recorded for mono through one loudspeaker, right? They were the definitive recordings and mixes because the Beatles were present at the time. Obviously, we were all involved in the mixes, the, the harmony balance, the guitar levels. The, all, so although we've got our finished sounds on the four tracks, right? Um, we don't re-EQ on the mix. It's all done. Also, it's a level control thing, a little drum break, a little bass lick. A little of this, a little of that. So that's how we mix them. The Beatles are present at those mixes. Now, England is behind the times a few years on stereo. Stereo is reserved for classical recordings. So suddenly we've done Sgt. Pepper. And suddenly Capital want a stereo mix of Sgt. Pepper, which is now on four track. 
So we'd finished the last mix on the mono on what particular day it was, and Capitol Records urgently want a stereo mix. So what happened, we're on four tracks, which means you've got like three or four instruments on one track, two instruments on another track, you've got the vocal on another track, and you've got a fourth track with a bit of everything on it. So the only way we can mix those four tracks in a stereo situation is like extreme left and right and a stereo and pan pot the fourth track depending on what instrument is on it. So it wasn't designed for stereo. With all those tracks were designed up until, uh, until Abbey Road as mono recordings. And the definitive mixes and recordings are on the mono CD set or the, the mono vinyl set. And the Beatles were present in the same room as we all mixed them as a team. They weren't there when we did the stereo mixes because there was no need for them to be there. You know, we could remember our moves and so forth. You know, so no, that's, that's a good, good, good question. What's been most rewarding about your career overall? Oh, um, I'll tell you what's been most rewarding. Coming to Berlin, New Jersey? <laughs> <laughs> No, no, actually, actually no, 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 actually, seriously, I mean, I, uh, you know, I've, I've got a lot of information as things I did not know about by coming here. Um, and, <laughs> but I think the most rewarding thing was when, when I wrote my book, and I realized, you know, we made something special, but when the book first came out, you know, people were, because um, I know there's been ups and, ups and downs with the Beatles, you know, you know John, you know, better than Jesus Christ, and with this and that. So anyway, when the book first came out, it was in New Jersey, and the book, and it was at one of the Beatle conventions, and th it was like a, a Star Wars convention, right? And I realized at that point that people were coming up and saying, do you know, Jeff, you know, Jeff, you know, we actually got engaged when we heard Eleanor Rigby, you know, and that's our song for the rest of our lives, you know? And I'm, I'm, sort, of got t I'm sort of tearing up in a way, right? It was at that moment I realized because of all these things that people were saying, to, I did not realize at that point that it meant so much to so many people. Oh, it's it's life changing, all right. <laughs> no, but yeah, you know, but no, no it, but that's yeah. that's the most rewarding thing ever for me, and I don't right. mind talking about it because it keeps my mind alive, and I realise exactly what it meant to people, you know, which is to me is really really rewarding, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, over here. What is your favourite Beatles song? Oh shit. Um. <laughs> <laughs> No, there's got to be a minute. I, well, I, uh, here, there, and everywhere, right? I guess. Um, because I know that a lot of effort went into that on the harmonies with Paul. And obviously, A Day in the Life, which is like an epic, because it was at the time of recording it. And obviously, Tomorrow Never Knows, because it, it changed, it revolutionized the way we record records. So I can't give one, one answer on, 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 on that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Don't even ask. Because <laughs> we'll have a fight. <laughs> no, I'm not going to say to you, would you want to repaint the Sistine Chapel or the Mona Lisa? No. This gentleman over here. Yes. How did you do that? that was so well, <laughs> well, if I get the story correctly right here, um, we'd done a mix of, I don't know whichever track it was, it may have been Rain or one of the other tracks um, before that. And John, we didn't have, like, as you know, cassettes or, or CDs to take home to listen to a rough mix, right? So John wanted a reel-to-reel -reel mix because we all had reel-to-reel -reel tape recorders at home. So John wanted a mix of whatever track we were doing. It may have been rain, I don't know. Um, so we sent, he went along with his little tape with the remix, and he came in the next day and said, there's something wrong with this tape. It, it doesn't play right. <laughs> and John being wrong, you know, John, had, had threaded it up backwards, right? So he's listening to this mi remix we've done for him backwards. So, after, after that, you know, well, John, you've been playing it backwards, man, you know? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, what led from that, as you well know, was all the black backward guitar sounds and one of the other funny things that happened that day, because I'm trying to sort of, con well, figure this one out, because we said, oh, wow, you know, 
perhaps we, sh we should actually, we were all having a laugh about this in the control room. So there was a, a tape library at EMI and we said, well, perhaps the Russian language is like English backwards, right? <laughs> so so, so, so we, we, we got some tapes out with Russian language on, right? <laughs> and put it on backwards, right? But of course it sounded like Russian backwards, you know. <laughs> uh, anyone understand? Uh, Non-Beatles question, if I could? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, my second favorite band is Cheap Trick, and I believe you and George Martin worked on All Shook Up. Yes, yes. Any particular memories or favorite moments or thoughts? No, no, just, no just good fun. Which, I mean, what a great band, you know? Yeah. I mean, Jesus Christ. I mean, but no, because some of that was made in, in, in Montserrat, you know, uh -huh. when we had the studio in Montserrat. And I think we all did, we actually routined it in uh, in, um, in not, uh, where where, they, where did they come from? You know where they Rockford, came from? Oh, Rockford, Illinois. Yeah, Rockford. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. So so we went to Rockford and and um, routined some of the tracks, and then we went to Montserrat and started recording it there. Yeah, but what a, as you know, it led to us doing that Sergeant Pepper thing in Vegas and so forth. But what a band, my God. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. Back here by the wall. Yeah. Hi. No, well, thank you for saying so. Uh, that's that, that's fa no, fantastic. No, and, and you sort of, you know, saying that, I hope, obviously you are, you apply that to the artistic value of music, right? Well, I'm, I'm a record producer. Right. And I'm not an engineer. But well, I'm not, I, 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 you know. No, well, no, you're quite no, no, you're you're quite right. You know, you're quite right because getting back to the drum track, which was the drum loops, that was the first time we'd ever used a drum loop, and and as far as the, you know, the the loops were concerned, there's a way of making those loops, and there was like eight loops in a bag that came up on certain faders, and there was only like two two tape machines in one control room, and luckily that day there were another studios that were free. And the maintenance engineers had the loops on their machines and another studio had the loops on their machines and they got a lot on drumsticks and stuff. So we were like playing, playing the first synthesizer, you know? I mean, are you given notoriety for that? I want to no. say hip-hop No, no, not at all. Not, not at all. But, but when you look back on it, it's just, thankfully for what you've just said, it was maybe Stockhausen was doing something similar. That I don't know. But this was like the first time there was a drum loop, there was loops, there was this and so forth, you know. And royalties, Jeff, yeah, royalties. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, no, yeah, I wish, I wish, <laughs> right? Uh, anyone at the back? I can't see from here. Uh, uh, this gentleman over here? I can't quite remember. It must have been halfway through the Revolver album, I'm not quite sure. Because we used to discuss the bass sounds on many occasions. And I'm always, you know, because he was aware of American records as well with this, this enormous bass sound on them. And there was a certain uh, mechanical reason why we, we weren't allowed to let bass swings and stuff go on into the vinyl. The and, the yeah, but I mean, it's got more presence on it. The Hofner was not a really, really nice bass to record it. It depended on the song, I guess. Because I guess what would happen, you'd have to build the song around the bass sound rather than diminish the bass because of overdubs, if you could do overdubs, you know. Um, but I think it was some, somewhere halfway through the Revolver, al Revolver album. And of course, you know, on Rain and Paperback Writer, we're still discussing bass sounds. And my theory was, let's try a loudspeaker as a microphone, because the bass speaker can push the bass out, and maybe another speaker can take it back in and wire that up as a microphone. <laughs> Yes, I, my memory of all, of all this is the fact that I think when we laid that, I don't know at what point, maybe not on, re, on many of the revolver tracks, but after that, we used to lay down the basic rhythm track and Paul would go away and work out the bass part and come back like two days later and overdub the bass. That's, that's my, my feeling on that. Because, he, because of his now classical sort of um, 
involvement with, with Jane Asher and so forth, he used to give a lot of thought into the bass parts. And he used to go away and maybe three days later or two days later, he'd come in with a bass part, which was really complicated. You know, it wasn't just done on the session, as far as I remember. It's, but on the early stuff on Revolver, maybe. That's the only, I, you know, because it's so many years ago, but that, that's really what happened, you know. It was like two days later, I'll do the bass. I've been thinking about it at home, you know. So the basic rhythm track was done without a bass because there was no, I don't use any, there was no DI bass. No one else played a bass part. Maybe some root notes, I've got no idea. But both, basically all those rhythm tracks were done without a click track and no bass. This gentleman over here. Yeah. Yes, um, well, because obviously, um, I decided on because, uh, you know, I think you know how the, the, the track was recorded, right? It was like three tracks of harmonies. So what I decided to do on because there was the three of three, the three Beatles were doing the harmony parts, which were double tracks, and they sat in a semicircle, and Ringo was sitting on the end of the semicircle, um, but he never sang, right? It was just camaraderie. And, uh, no, it really, and, and um, so it was in a semicircle because, again, Paul possibly was like the conductor, which meant you could conduct the mouth movements to stop and do the T's and the S's, and so it's all completely in time, and Paul's conducting this vocal. So what I decided to do on Because, because it was so beautiful and open, right? I, in those days, you know, we used compressors to compress the dynamic range, and I knew the vocal inside out. So what I decided to do, I'm not going to use any compressors, right? Because I think that's the first time we used the, well, not the first time, but the Moog bass is on it and all the rest of the stuff. So I decided to ride the vocals myself because I knew the vocal words inside out. So I'm being a human compressor. So that's how all those vocals were recorded. And as you know, it's the most beautiful sound. But of course, when that's been re reissued, they've digitally compressed it. Right, which is completely destroying the, the original artistic value of uh, what that record yeah, was, because they, no, they don't know that it was recorded in, in that fashion. Um, but anyway, so it was like at the time, you know, the most beautiful harmony vocal recording ever, you know? And when we did the anthology, we tried to do um, a mix without the backing track, because there was a click track involved here. Um, and I was trying to, they wanted to take the, take the, or I did, wanted to take the backing track away from the vocals and there's this version of just vocals with no backing track. And it took like two days to do that because what happened, when it came to the end, because I had headphones on, there's the click tracks going and I'm trying to pull that back the last decay of the last word, but you can still like, and I couldn't get rid of it. So what I did, I fed um, through RLS 10s those big white elephant speakers, as they say, into number one studio and put some mics up. And what I actually did, I sent the signal down there so I could actually fade that last nuance of those tail ends of the vocals and pull it back and get the resonance of number one Abbey Road studio to actually continue the end. And that's the only way I could do it, but it took like two days to do it, just to get rid of that little click click from the click track. Let's do uh, two more questions over here, and then we'll do one back there. So um, it seems like one of, the, um, one of the things that sets extraordinary people like yourself apart from ordinary people is that they see failures as an opportunity for growth. So can you think of any experience that maybe you saw that as a failure at the time and that you really like, learned from or grew from? Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no, I'm, I'm just trying to think. Um, uh, no, I can't really... I mean, I think there's probably a point when I thought something was not right with my thought process and I was getting blamed for it. I think it may have... It, maybe it was towards the end of, end of the White Album that I'm a failure, or, or at the beginning of it. Um, I, I can't really, without, as I said, thinking about it for, for, for a couple of hours... There's obviously points, probably with other bands maybe, or whatever, you, you do get this doubt in your mind. And, and I think, it actually, I tell you, well, we're getting off, to, off, off the subject now with Beatles, but I know going through the 70s um, and into the 80s, um, I, we started with Mott the Hoople or whatever, not necessarily them, but I've got, I could not, um, 
I was beginning to fail the fact that I couldn't recall guitars anymore, electric guitars. They sounded terrible. And I'm thinking, Jeff, you know, you've done all these Beatle records, you've got great guitar sounds. Why can't you recreate these sounds? Being um, not aware of the fact, I'm still thinking it's my fault, right? Um, but it was the musicians. And, and what, what, but, but what happened, I went to San Francisco and Count Basie's orchestra was playing with Joe Pass on guitar. And Joe came out with a little amp and put it on a little bent wood chair and plugged his guitar in and it was just awesome. And I thought, Jeff, it's not you, you know. <laughs> And that, no, I was, that's serious. I was get, it was the musicians, they were just getting so insecure. I mean, that, there was a, well, I always tell this story. Insecurity, probably, I think it was late 70s, early 80s, maybe. And Human League were in their studios in London. And they spent a week getting the snare drum sound. <laughs> all, you, all you ever heard from the studio was someone banging a snare drum for five days. That's like living at Keith Howing's house. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, one last question over here. Uh, uh, question about yeah. the, um, just to kind of backtrack a little bit about the mastering. I know when you started out, you, were still, like, you started by mastering, but when you started to put out your records and your recordings, did you feel that because of the amount of low end that you were producing, the dynamic of frequency range, that you were going to have a problem mastering the record? No, 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 not at all. I mean, I, although I started out as an assistant engineer by observing other, other recording engineers like Norman Smith and so forth, don't forget we, we're, only, we're, make, we're mixing and recording records for vinyl. So the, I'm looking at a VU meter and if I know there's a bass swing going to plus three, the vinyl's going to jump, right? So I, I know that when, when I'm sort of mixing, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm quite aware. Can you just elaborate once more on, on, on your question? No, I no, I, I no, I because the, I used to. I was trying to, although we had no low end control, and of course, when we were working, on, if we're going back to Beatles again, and we're working on uh, Altex 604Es as speakers, there's not a lot of low end coming from that. But I do realise when I was mixing, I could see that on the VU meters, so I, I had to be very, very, very aware of that. And then we got into heavier discussions with McCartney and mastering engineers when I start recording. We want more bass on our records. We want more this, more that. So it was a bit of a fight for us. But I had to be extremely careful. And then EMI invented something called ATOC or something like that, which was like a com conversion amplifier that, that altered the, 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 the equalization of certain bass notes, which lasted for about two weeks. But there was one younger mastering engineer called Tony Clark who was on my side and Tony used to write, try and put as much bass on as, as he could on, on our records but I knew exactly by watching a VU meter what I was supposed to be doing because you know you, you can't do a mix and the record's going to jump because what happened on early days on Beatle records and I've forgotten which record it was they, they actually uh, pressed like 250,000 copies of one of the records and EMI used to um, check it on the cheapest possible little gramophone or record player that they could, and it actually jumped. And then they had to re repress 250,000 copies of that record. So the, the, um, the rules after that were well, if you, you're going to master a Beatle record, you've got to slash all the bass from 60 cycles downwards, just cut, cut it. And the Beatles found out about this, and they said, no way, no way. You know? So, sorry? It was in early days. One of the records was rejected because it jumped on. Sorry. When? Um, when? When there was a meet meeting and they said no. Some you know obviously there's a big managerial meeting over this, which was ridiculous. I mean you're going to play it on the cheapest cheapest little record player you can find, which I understand, but I mean they pressed two hundred and fifty thousand and have to repress them because it jumped on this little cheap record player probably from Woolworths or whatever. You know? No, I'm, ser I'm serious. That, that was the mentality. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. But right. anyway, we had to... Sl they, they, it was before I was a mastering engineer, but we had to, they were told to slash all the bass below 60 cycles. Wow. Thank you for all the great questions for Jeff. All and, right. uh, Jeff, thank you for... Oh, 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 thank you for being the catalyst <laughs> and uh, giving us all those sounds that... Oh, right.
we grew up to and uh, still happening today, and you're an innovator. That's thank you. Jeff Emmerich, ladies thank and gentlemen. That's thank you. Thanks. Okay, good. Where, where, where? All right, Jeff will be signing books in a little bit, so uh, make yourselves comfortable, and uh, we'll get to that in a few. Yeah, Proceeding was made possible by the Victor Talking Machine Company and music fans worldwide. Investing in Victor means investing in musicians and their music. Be sure to like and subscribe to this channel for the latest updates on Victor Talking Machine Company's mission to change the music industry. Visit victorrecords.com to discover new Victor records and artists, and make sure to visit our catalog of Victor home audio instruments. Look for the dog on your next Victrola, record player turntable, Bluetooth speaker, headphones, and more.